And if I could invite everybody to please sta stand for our opening karakia. To Tawa Mai Ilunga, to Tawa Mai Garo, to Tawa Mai Roto, to Tawa Mai Wato, he can so only to only to Timoni Ora, he can so for me, who ye are. And we do not have any apologies. Great to have a full complement of elected members here for uh, what is probably you know, one of our more important hearing processes that we do. Do we have any conflicts of interest? Uh, announcements by myself. Just uh, wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of uh, the commu community members who have made submissions into our long-term plan, uh, 710 submissions in total. Uh, it made for some very interesting weekend reading and really looking forward to hearing uh, those that are going to come and actually uh, do verbal, verbal submissions today and then enter into deliberations tomorrow. Uh, announcements by management. Um, through the Mayor, tēnā koutou katoa. In this year's long-term plan submissions, I have decided to personally, um, to partially redact two submissions in the public domain. In both cases, the submitted personally identified staff members in a way that was discoverable and demeaning. As a council, we are committed to freedom of expression and transparency at all times. We are not and should not be above criticism. However, I reserve my right to maintain a safe workplace, free from improper pressure and harassment. In these two cases, the comments were made were public shaming, with no course of redress. Councillors have unredacted copies to deliberate fully and consider the views of all. I must point out with 710 submissions from the public, this has only been a course of action in two. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, just to advise that the hearing, of course, is being live streamed to our Council Facebook page and also being recorded. And just uh, emergency evacuation, this is a, a new venue for us. So in the event of the fire alarm sounding, please walk calmly to your nearest safe exit lit up with green lights. <coughs> So from these function rooms, you can turn left to the exit stairwell or turn right and back down the foyer stairs where you entered. And the assembly point is the front car park by the bus stop. Please do not use the lift. If you need assistance evacuating, please advise the venue building warden on duty. In the event of an earthquake, please drop cover and hold until the shaking stops. Please wait for instructions from a PGA staff member before evacuating. Be aware of loose building materials or any live wires that become exposed in the event of a serious earthquake. Uh, the bathrooms are located on the first floor at the top of the stairwell by the left. Excellent. So we have uh, a number of community members here already to do uh, our first session of verbal submissions. Speakers today will have 10 minutes to present and respond to questions from councillors. There will be a bell at five minutes, uh, just so you know that you're halfway through your time, and then second bell at 10 minutes. And just to uh, remind all presenters that your presentation must relate directly to your written submission and the uh, policy that you're addressing. So we will uh, get stuck into it. I would invite Amanda Jackson to uh, speak to us, please. Oh, and up the front here, yes. Welcome, Amanda. And if you could, there? if you could speak into the speaker so that thank it gets um, captured for the live stream and for our administrative staff. Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou My name is Amanda Jackson, um, and I'm here to support the submissions put forward by the Guardians of the Aquifer relating to Napier's water supply. Um, and just on a, s a side note, at the moment when um, conspiracy theories are rife, I think it is very, very important to fact check 
and rely on science for our decisions that we're making for Napier's future. Apart from wanting our water in Napier to be chlorine-free because of the taste, the colour, the smell of chlorinated water, which used to be so beautiful here and literally something to write home about, and to which I have been mildly allergic all my life, the chlorine, and am unable to swim in public treated pools, I am keen to trust science. The decision will be the councils and the publics, but I am very hopeful that they and we will be influenced by science, not fear, not clever talking, nor emotional responses to events that have been misrepresented and have no bearing on whether or not chlorine was in the water. I want the science and research undertaken by the community of enormous integrity and experience, and the results of both, to be the main influence in the decision that is made. Looking back, the tragedy and mismanagement in Havelock North would not have been avoided with chlorine in the water. Chlorine will not guard against a similar outbreak. Chlorine alone does not make our water safe. It masks indicators, and that is the science. Chlorine has qualities that make us unsafe, if even simply in the respect that we do nothing else and are lulled into a full sense of security. I fervently hope that we put our trust into science, and whichever outcome is the safest scientific way forward, then let's move in that direction. And the other pertinent point I wish to raise is the glaring anomaly in the source of the water we rely on for our drinking water. Surface water can be contaminated and may need chlorine. Our underground bores and underground aquifers are pristine. We know this. Our water is not under threat. Overzealous, risk-averse decisions have had a huge impact on the information which has currently, mistakenly, made people believe that chlorine will cure all. We use groundwater, uncontaminated groundwater, and if we exercise the right maintenance program and care of our bores, which the Hastings District Council did not, we have the safest resource one could ever expect. My message is, let's listen to the science. Thank you. Thank you, Amida. I'll just open up in case there's any questions from councillors. Um, thank you. And next up we have Sally Chandler. Welcome. Morena. Um, Kia ora Today um, I am representing Enviro Schools here in Hawke's Bay and more particularly um, Napier. So I would just like to take this opportunity first um, to thank you for um, having me here to speak but also for your continued funding support. Um, the link we have through different actions has ensured our good relationship with Napier City Council, environmental education and community engagement that is undertaken by Hawke's Bay Regional Council. Um, you will see in my submission this year that I included a future focus for environmental education with a push into the secondary sector. Um, I'm pleased to advise that um, HBRC has agreed through their LTP process funding for a, a 0.5 FTE to join me um, in the environmental education team at the Regional Council. Uh, a priority for this position will be to assess the best way to work in this sector to ensure the best outcomes. I'd like to share some achievements over the last few years. Um, the funding we receive from Napier City Council supports not only our delivery of facilitation to Enviro schools in Napier, but also means that we can respond to other requests for environmental education assistance. Uh, so a few other highlights. Um, we have continued with a water education resource delivery at Lake Tutera. Um, this is open to intermediate schools and all of our Napier intermediate schools have uh, been on this um, outing up to Tutera. 
not last year, it didn't go ahead, but prior to that, um, we have used your resources, um, your re reserves for other workshops through our Connected to Nature teacher workshops we've been to Dolbell Reserve, and we also use the Otara Outdoor Learning Centre at EIT. We have participated in the Keep Nappy Beautiful and Organic um, Recycling Days at Anderson Park. Uh, during lockdown, we continue to support our teachers and schools through online resources and Zoom meetings. So 2020 was a difficult year um, in the environmental ed education space, especially for our facilitators who need to go out into schools um, to do their jobs fully, but we still manage to support through um, creating those online resources. Later in 2020, we ran four uh, workshops for the Best Start Kindergarten Association, which have quite a few kindergartens throughout um, Napier and Hastings. And these were run in conjunction with the Predator Free 2050 educators. And it gave an opportunity to reach a wider audience with new tools and ideas for teaching in nature and lessons on sustainability. Coming up, um, as I mentioned, uh, we held a secondary school climate action camp in March 2021. Um, at that time, we worked closely with uh, Cameron Burton and Hannah Ludlow from Napier City Council, and they led a very successful field trip um, to the Ahuriri Estuary. It, it was designed to give these um, students an opportunity to look at the tributaries that enter the Ahuriri Estuary and how uh, the impacts of any stormwater pollution does end up in the Ahuriri estuary. So it was a great, um, we had a great response from the students for that. Uh, we also had the educators from the, um, the National Aquarium take part in the Climate Action Camp. The Napier schools who attended this were William Colenso, Taradal High, Tamatia High and Sacred Heart. In particular, since then, we have forged um, a better relationship with Tamatia High School, Taradale High and William Colenso, and we aim to work to support these schools and their students. Uh, Napier Boys were also at the camp, and we've had a little bit of a connection with Napier Boys over the last few years. Back in 2019, they reached out wanting to do some planting, and uh, within walking distance of the school, if possible, so through um, Deborah Stewart, uh, we, we initiated a little planting project at the Erickson Road Detention Ponds. So the weekend border boys got the opportunity to go out and do some planting there, and didn't happen last year, but they are starting up that process again this year. Uh, we're also working with the Year 10 cohort um, to help them achieve their Good Men Awards through community engagement, and so far we have held two cleanups um, with them, one at the Harakiki Walkway and one on Marine Parade between the bike pump park and the aquarium. Um, so we continue to work and support Napier City Council um, with the National Aquarium team, the Environmental Solutions team through their stormwater and education campaigns and plants, planting activities with um, parks and reserves. Also coming up, we will be joining Napier Central School with the planting at Guys Hill Road Reserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. I'll open up for questions from councillors. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Thank you, Sally, and it was really good to um, hear your presentation around all the work that you've done um, since we last saw you. Thank you. Um, just a question from me around how um, Enviro Schools get certainty of funding, maybe some of the other funding structures that you have um, with other partner councils. I'm just looking to understand if you need to apply for funding regularly or if there's ongoing service agreements or the like. Um, it is a, like a three year um, term or however Central Hawke's Bay District Council have just rolled over their funding without us um, requesting new funding the, the sh through this LTP process. Um, the majority of our funding does come from the regional council and that um, is secure. Um, and yes, as I said, they've, they've provided some more, hopefully going forward <coughs> from 1 July. So, but yes, uh, any extra funding we get from the TLAs is um, an ongoing process. Thank you. Councillor Bogue, then yeah, Councillor thank, Simpson. Thank you, Sally. Whoops. Just a little bit um, to elaborate on Deputy Mayor's um, question. We're often 
when people come to ask us for, for funds or continuation of funds that they seek from other councils, <coughs> um, they often give us a comparison of how we are playing our part. And I just wondered, um, you're asking for a renewal of the 15,000 per annum. Correct. Um, how does that compare with uh, for Hastings District Council, for example? Um, we've had no funding from Hastings District Council oh, okay. uh, in the last trimester. Um, I am actually presenting to them this afternoon. Oh, um, and uh, the officer's um, response um, is positive, so I'm hoping that they will start up with their funding again. Oh, well, this um, might help you get that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, just one other question. I just wondered, there was no, you made no comment about the Ahuriri Regional Park um, in your submission, uh, you know, for or against or whatever, or is that outside your brief to make comments like that? Um, Probably outside my brief. I mean, I'm not actually a resident of Napier, so I didn't know how far I could actually um, speak on that. Um, obviously, I'm for the Ahuriri Regional Park. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for education especially, um, and I look forward to what um, sort of resources and infrastructure might be there to make that a positive outcome for our Kamariki. Councillor Simpson. Thank you, Sally, for coming and talking to us and the, the good work that you obviously do. Just a query around your programs. Yep. You mentioned the Napier Boys High School where they did a local activity around their local school. Is that how your engagement with many of the other schools operate, so they do work in their local communities? Ideally, um, that would, uh, no, I think that they should look at their own backyard first. So if, if it can't be something they can do within their own school grounds, I and mean, they might want to go a bit further afield, um, and often schools um, have an issue with transport, the costs involved of moving students. Um, so if in this particular instance, it was within walking distance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Sally, just wondering, are you aware of our fund that we have to Pearl Waitanga, which um, some of your schools could access to assist with some of your planting projects and things like yes, that? Yes, I am. I did actually promote that in my last um, leaflet newsletter. Fantastic. So I am aware of that. Excellent. There's no questions from any other councillors. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you. And next up we have Stephanie Murphy, Stuart Ainsley and Gareth Menzer from the Hawke's Bay Airport. Welcome. <coughs> Marina, thanks for letting us come along this morning to speak to our submission uh, on the Napier City Council long-term plan. Our submission relates to the Ahuriri Regional Park. I wanted to start off by saying primarily that we support the concept of the Ahuriri Regional Park and all the all the things that it provides uh, to the community around uh, welfare and environmental uh, and sustainable outcomes. But we do have some concerns around uh, wildlife uh, management and some of the risks that that, that uh, puts around the airport, which will continue to grow. So these are predominantly public safety uh, related matters. So. I've got with me today Gareth Menser, our operations manager, and he's going to speak specifically to the issue of uh, uh, wildlife safety. Thanks, Gareth. I think we've just got a couple of technical difficulties. No, there we go. Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for having us. So as Stuart said, I'm going to have a chat to you about uh, wildlife in and around Hawke's Bay Airport. Uh, I'm going to distill three years of knowledge into ten minutes or less, so um, there might be questions afterwards or even post this if there's anything that comes up. Happy to answer things um, afterwards as well. So what we're going to talk about is around Hawke's Bay Airport. So we've got a reasonably interesting natural environment. So we've got a number of areas surrounding the airport that we don't typically have a lot of control over. So you can see there we've got a swamp adjacent to the runway. That is the one area that we do control that's on our land. Otherwise we've got a wetland which is dock protected. 
Uh, we've got the Southern Marsh, which is dock protected. We've got the Beacon Swamp, which again has dock protection. We've got the Northern Marsh, which has dock protection. We've got the Weshaw Wildlife Reserve, which is dock protected, but is also looked after from the Napier City Council from a pest management point of view. And then we've got the estuary as well that surrounds the airport. What I'm going to focus on today is current high-risk species for us. So these are species that present the biggest risk in and around the airport. So that's blackback gulls, black swans and Canada geese. Uh, Canada geese, you'll be familiar with the movie The Miracle on the Hudson. So that was an aircraft that was um, taken down and crash landed in the, the Hudson River and that was a crash from Canada geese which are a bird population in and around the airport. Black swans, we've had move on to the Weshaw Wildlife Reserve. Around Christmas there was probably, there was a static population of about 50 and that increased to 200. Uh, and we don't know why, and we, nobody knows why that increased, and that population has started to reduce again, but again, we're not entirely sure why that's happened. These high-risk species surround the airport, Canada geese in particular. So you'll see on that slide there the locations that the Canada geese are. So they are directly below the 3-4 approach, the 1-6 approach, and to the west of the airport as well. So that the advantage for us, the Canada geese are also a pest species for people around us as well. So they are typically a problem on the Langcorp farm, which is to the west of us. We've also got feral geese to the north, so they are on the, the northern marsh. Blackback gulls, which nest in and around the airport. There was a colony in Beacon Swamp in the 80s that was removed. We have had some turn up there again. And then black swans, I mentioned before the black swans that have moved on to the, the wildlife reserve. The reason we've highlighted these species is just the mass of them. So in terms of size, Canada geese are up to, to 5 kilos, blackback gulls up to 1.8 kilos, and then the, the swans can be 5.5 to 6 kilos each. What does it mean in terms of where we sit? It's something that we don't like to talk about all too much, but we don't have the, the best result, or we don't have the, the best statistics in terms of our stats. So what the CAA do, they have a rolling 12-month average. Um, what we've circled there is where we sit. At the moment, we have the, um, the worst strike rate in the country per 10,000. What that means in real numbers, though, is one strike in January and then two in February, March, April and May. So it's not, you'll see 13.5 there, we're not having 13.5. That's when it's equated to the per 10,000. Uh, the right-hand table shows our incident rate is high, but our trend is downward. And so what I'll talk about in the next slide is the work that we have done over the last couple of years. We had Avishaw, which are an international aviation consultancy, do a wildlife management program for us right where you see that red circle. So we had our highest incidence of, of bird strike, and since then we've had a 40% reduction in the number of birds that we hit. And that's through a variety of different um, uh, techniques. So where before we typically dealt on airport, now, and the reason we're talking to you is because we don't. We look around the airport. So an airport, we manage it very well, but what we can't control is birds in the environment around us. So that's why we look at the Wildlife Reserve, that's why we go into the, um, onto the estuary, that's why we look at the Landcorp Farm. We do counts on a uh, weekly basis, so we're counting birds around us. So there, I think it was 96 different species of birds that have been identified on the West Shore Wildlife Reserve um, historically. We actively manage 30 species that are on airport that we're keeping an eye on. Uh, you can see in the right hand graph there, that is our bird strike rate. So we are trending below the average, and so that's something that we're constantly working on. The unfortunate thing is we do have bird strikes, as I've mentioned. So we had a bird strike on the 23rd of August 2019 above Beacon Swamp, so that's directly off the northern end of the runway, and we hit uh, an New Zealand aircraft hit up to five blackback gulls, so that aircraft had to turn around. You can see the damage on the nose cone there, and also the damage on the rest of the aircraft. That has a significant operational impact, not to mention the safety risk as well. Questions? No. So that was, uh, that was three years and uh, under five minutes, I think, so if there's anything you want to ask. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Very well done. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Um, Thank you for that. 
Uh, is there specific things that we can do when we're designing the plant? plant the park to disencourage those higher risk species of birds? Uh, yeah, absolutely there is. There is a lot that can be done. Um, and I think that's part of our conversation here is for us to be a part of any conversation that occurs in those areas. Um, whilst we are experts on airport and also the impact of birds on airport, we're not experts on the birds themselves. So there are people out there that can absolutely pr provide advice around the right environment for uh, to discourage those birds. Councillor Tantani. Kia ora kōrua. Um, thank you very much for your submission. So uh, with your three years of study, could you tell me what percentage of the birds that you were watching in that three years of study are unique to that particular geographical location? Because I know we've got something like a number of species of birds that use that area, but like the godwit, um, some of them only visit certain portions of our geography. So do we know what portion of the, those species are unique to the locations around the airport? Uh, that's a fantastic question, and no, I don't, other than the godwit. Um, typically the species like the ones we've mentioned, blackback gulls, Canada geese, um, and swans are reasonably common. So, um, and the second question, if I may, was around, um, you're surrounded by red in your diagram yep. with uh, areas of natural significance and uh, a growing city and a, a, an airport wanting to grow. So what, um, I'm not too sure if this is the right time or place, but what are the long-term intentions uh, with the regional park as a potential concept across the waterway? You've identified the avian risks to airport operations. There's going to be expansion and growth. So is there, in the opinion of the um, airport, an opportunity to build a strong partnership to try and manage those risks? Or are we seeing that eventually we're going to reach a point where we're just going to have to walk around and either shoot the planes or shoot the birds? <laughs> what's so, the long term? Yeah. What's the long term picture so, here? So I wouldn't encourage shooting the aeroplanes for a start. <laughs> but, but I think, look, Thank I you. think, I think uh, the clue is that through consultation and design, I think we can actually create a positive effect on the wildlife, and that's the key. I think is that if there isn't ongoing collaboration, we could end up attracting wildlife that's counterproductive to safety. So. I think uh, it's all about consultation, collaboration, and we might even be able to solve some of the challenges we have. But you know, a lot, a lot of these birds are, are migratory birds, and they're fairly large, dense birds that cause a lot of damage. So if we can potentially work together to solve some of these problems, that would be a much better outcome for the whole community. Thank you, yep. Stuart. So ultimately, long term, you think it's definitely possible that if we continue to work together, we can work around these factors rather than one cancelling out the other. Working together is always favoured rather than working. How far are you, son? Thank you. Me. Thank you. Councillor Bogue. Uh, thank you very much. Just picking up from some of the items you just mentioned then, um, the changes to Watchman Road and the entrance to the airport was a wonderful example of working together, which you know protected everybody's interests, including that of the natural inhabitants. But my question is, the gulls, geese and the swans, are they protected? Are they pests? Um, are there programs to cull yeah, them or yeah, protect them? Yeah, uh, another good question. And that is the advantage when we look at those, <coughs> um, those species. They are three pest species. So Canada geese are a significant problem. Um, that is a problem for um, City Council, Regional Council, ourselves, Landcorp, so they are a pest species. Um, swans, we require a game bird licence to be able to, to shoot if required. Um, and the blackback gulls are a pest species as well. So we have permission from Fish and Game if we need to remove black swans. We have dock permission for targeting in certain areas. We work with the City Council currently on the West Shore Wildlife Reserve um, and also the Regional Council if we need to close bike paths. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Hi team, thank you for coming and talking to us and um, I suppose thank you to a commitment to, to working with us if the regional park is something that council's keen to progress. Um, I suppose a question from me is, do you see in the regional park concept an opportunity to address some of the existing issues that you have as well, i.e. through good design could we alter flight paths and um, habitat of say some of your existing pest species? Do you see that as a potential um, opportunity if we were to work together in the design of regional park habitat? I think that's probably a simple yes. 
Uh, it's just understanding what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. to work yeah. through it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you very Brilliant. much. Thanks Bang very on much. 10 minutes. <laughs> And next I would invite Dallas Knight to come and speak to us. Welcome Dallas. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Kirsten Wise, councillors and everyone. Marina Tenakoi, thank you for this opportunity to campaign for the sanctuary and the sanctity of Clive Square, which is an historic and beautiful central Napier jewel. Clive Square Precinct has become a place where individuals are now <coughs> anxious about their personal safety and Clive Square businesses are struggling to deliver their services. I have been associated with and owned property in Clive Square for over 40 years, and our property in Clive Square West has been medical rooms long before we were there in 1978. My husband, Doug Knight, has provided consultant surgical services to the people of Hawke's Bay, including Wairau, for over 40 years from this place in Clive Square. In 1998, the Napier City Council granted resource consent to Whatever It Takes Trust at 25 Clive Square West. And since 2016, they have provided outreach services for homeless people. Subsequently, the character of this Clive Square precinct has changed from being a professional medical quarter to attracting those associated with gangs, drug dealing, the use of drugs, rough sleeping, trespassing, damage and depositing human filth on our properties. About four years ago, I spoke to the Napier City Council when daily dis disruption came to a head and there was fear for the public's personal safety because of violence, drugged individuals, women openly providing sex in cars, drug-related rubbish and needles, trespassing and property damage. It intermittently subsides when the Napier City Council patrols focus on the area, but it is continuing and relentless necessitating us to patrol our own property at 4.30 a.m. to ensure nobody is trespassing, sleeping and leaving trash. Recently, the outreach centre and patrols stopped rough sleepers at 25 Clive Square West, that's the outreach centre, and Woods is currently not providing services on that property. This has improved the perception of personal safety and it has improved some of the disruption. The Napier City Council commissioned a Napier Outreach Service Location Review and in March, Senior Advisor on Policy, Rebecca Peterson, presented an excellent in-depth report focusing on relocation. A subcommittee was set up to investigate another venue for this outreach service. Nothing has come of this to date. My <coughs> message, Clive Square needs to be restored to a place of safety, peace and tranquility. Safe central city areas are essential for Napier City and for businesses in the area to thrive. Clive Square West businesses deserve and need a permanent solution. They need reassurance that the outreach centre will not reopen on these premises. And I've just been um, noticed that um, 
Member of Parliament Stuart Nash is going to speak to this. And in his submission, which I briefly saw, if I'm accurate, um, his wife was assaulted by a drug person in Clive Square when she was there with her two children. And I find this is appalling. And public safety is an issue. And although the outreach is not currently operating, there are many people there who are, have antisocial uh, behaviours and open drug dealing is still going on daily in Clive Square. And when people take drugs, you cannot anticipate their behaviour. It is not safe. And Clive Square is a very important part of our city. It's, it's, it's a wonderful sanctuary and a beautiful place. And the gardeners do a fantastic job. It's very important that these people who are displaying drug dealing, antisocial behaviours are not displaying behaviours there. Thank you. Thank you, Dallas. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your views on the uh, proposed investigation into an ambassador program. Do you think that uh, introducing a program like that would assist with the antisocial behaviour in Clive Square? Well, I don't know what an ambassador would do. The security first people at the present time, they, they are there and of course they've got to be um, on good terms with these homeless. <coughs> it's not just the homeless people, they've got to be in good terms. Um, but they, they're powerless to do anything. And uh, one thing that really, really disturbed me, this disturbed me far too much, well, a lot, um, what, one sun, a sunny day we were there, it was in the weekend, we went around to the back and there were two Maori women on the back. They were both drugged and one of the Maori women was pregnant and her big pregnant belly was, was exposed because that's how I could see she was pregnant. And, and I know that <laughs> authorities know about this lady because I spoke to the security first guard and she said, he said, Yes, she does take drugs and and she does drink. And so even the security guard knows about her. So this lady is having a baby that our society is going to have to deal with forever. Mm. And it's uh, something's got to be done about the drugs in Clive Square. It's terrible. It's so open and blatant and um, I don't know. I don't know about an ambassador, but it's it's. There's lots of sympathy, but something must be done. Mm. And uh, I take it that you would be regularly informing police when you're seeing any sort of drug activity or sale or. Well, it's not really any use because the only way you can get to police is dialing one one one. That's the only way you can get through to police, and they may come or mm. whatever. And if they come. We don't. I don't ever hear back. Like we have, um, we we trespassed somebody, and I rang one 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 to get them off the property because they were drugged, and um, and we don't hear any more. But generally, if people are there, my husband's a very <laughs> lovely, civil, nice person. He 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 asks their name, and and he's quite he's lovely to them. And they say, oh, yes, you know, and they sort of shuffle off and take all their stuff. But the rubbish and the damage, a few weeks ago we were broken into. The, the door was all damaged. There were windows broken. And since then, my husband's been down there this morning repairing it. Mm. I mean, it's, it's just awful, really. Yeah. And lots of sympathy, but nothing done. And, and I know Stuart Nash is going to speak to this too. Um, and the building is owned by Housing New Zealand and um, I mean it would solve the problem I think more if, um, if the building was sold and some other perhaps medical service or was used, had some other use, not, not, not as an outreach centre. Yeah. Yep. Just, I'll just open up to other councillors for questions. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Thank you Dallas for your, um, for your submission and, and I, I think you state it really well when you say a lot of sympathy but where's the action um, and that's what we as council I'm interested to hear from you what action you think we can take I've heard your view on um, the ambassador program not necessarily being um, effective in this space and I've heard you suggest you know that we suggest an alternative location through the report uh, that we had commissioned but other than suggesting an alternative location to the crown who are the, the landlord 
what tools do you think council have that we could better use? Well, well, I don't know, but um, WIT, whatever it takes, um, runs the outreach centre, and the people who are homeless, um, they have they have their benefits, so they have quite a lot of money because they're not paying rent and telephone and all the things that everybody else has to pay, and that they need money to live and. So they got a lot. Of, they can got enough money to eat or do whatever. But they, a, a lot of them spend it on the drugs, um, and they've all got transport because they've got their bikes. And I know that they can get bedding and things like that and clothes because uh, those aren't things aren't a problem to them. Um, but their drug taking is a problem to our society. And so, what 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 doesn't even have to provide the service, why does WIT keep on providing a service to these people, Who, why do they do that? I don't know. They can go and have coffee at the local coffee bar like everybody else. Thank you. <laughs> Any further? <laughs> Councillor Crystal. Um, have you written to government about this issue? Like, I have been to see Stuart Nash on yeah. quite a few occasions, and mm -hmm. Stuart is very sympathetic. Um, I have um, been, I've been through through Stuart Nash, and I have heard that um, from his his um, 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 assistant that he wants the building sold, and I thought he was going to speak to. Um, Member of Parliament, um, Megan Woods, I think, who is the Minister for Housing, who does own that building. And another thing I did hear just recently as well was that the Neighbour City Council have granted a resource consent for an alcohol and gaming uh, premises that's probably within about 50 metres of Clive Square. These um, people have got money and they will drink there and the behaviour of that won't that won't um, improve their behaviour, I'm afraid, and they will go uh, they will go to Clive Square, <laughs> and it's not going to improve anything, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, Dallas. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah. And I'd like to invite uh, Ian Matahi to speak, please. Tamihi tu tahi ki te atua, kia tau mai te aroha, ngā manaakitanga o te atua. My um, first acknowledgement is to God, uh, to the Mayor, <coughs> Councillors, uh, Distinguished Guests, uh, Atamari e koutou katoa. Uh, water supply, um, I don't need a harp on about this, we've heard every complaint there is to make, um, let's just get on with it and... Um, uh, go with the proposal to begin work now and hopefully in five years our water will be um, uh, up to scratch to where we want it to be. Um, that's all I want to say on that matter because um, I'm getting a migraine myself just uh, listening to all the complaints. Uh, Ahuriri Regional Park, um, this is a big interest to uh, the sport that I'm invo involved with, uh, Wakaama or outrigging. Uh, Having driven and walked around uh, part of that area uh, with a number of um, uh, members of the Wakaama fraternity, uh, this would come in handy um, not only for Wakaama, but uh, uh, it will uh, also be uh, educational uh, for um, especially our kids, uh, primary schools, intermediates, especially because um, they can't get out on the ocean where we're, where we're based at Pandora Pond. It's all right for the adults because we can go out on the ocean and train, but for our young ones, they're stuck in Pandora Pond, and it's not a very safe area, as we all know, it's not very clean. Um, should that area open up, uh, the regional park, uh, that would be uh, very advantageous for our primary schools. Um, also, um, it would uh, uh, create uh, an understanding of our culture uh, especially for our, our club, the new club that I'm involved with, 80% of our members are non-Māori. And um, 
they have a passion, the same passion that I have, and they also now are getting an understanding into the um, uh, the area and what it meant so means so much to us with regards to um, uh, the, the wars before colonisation and how tribes used to fight for areas around that that regional park and um, yeah I see it as being a very advantageous to uh, uh, to the Waka Arm fraternity and also to um, uh, uh, people in general who are walking the regional park who want to know the uh, the history of the area um, it doesn't have to be about Waka Arm, but to be on the water itself we could take the people around that area we I mean when it's high tide we go right up back past the airport to Bayview to train. That's how uh, good the water is up that end. Uh, unfortunately, when it's low tide, there is a man-made uh, rock wall there. Um, when it's low tide, we can't get over that wall. So uh, we know our limits. And that's also, I don't know who built it, uh, but uh, whoever did, it stops the big rush of water going out so that there is still a big pond there um, west of the airport. Um, for training and all that. And if they were to put in something like that in the new regional park, uh, a natural um, man-made uh, rock wall um, to stop the sudden rush of uh, water going out on low tide, that would be great. Um, the area that I've looked at with a couple of other people, um, geez, we're only asking for 500 metres. You've got how many, how many hectares there of uh, water that you're looking to dredge? Beautiful. Uh, I couldn't ask for any more, um, for our kids especially. Uh, I mean, and we don't want to put uh, another facility there for Waka Arma, just a key to a gate to get in to haul our trailers in there, drop them off, and then the kids can float downstream on a high tide back to Pandora Pond. That type of thing. That's, why, uh, that's, that's my submission on, um, on the regional park. 100% um, for what what you're hoping to do, and I hope it goes ahead. Uh, to being a community facility, uh, this is a big one, because I live in what I know. Um, a few years ago, uh, a lot of our people spoke about um, uh, having an uh, overnight shelter for the homeless, uh, to, to help just to the offload of those that are rough sleepers, to have some sort of overnight shelter where, I don't know, you get the Māori wardens come in and look after it at night, make sure that there's no wrongdoings or anything like that going on. Um, and then, you know, send them out um, with a hearty breakfast, I don't know, what, whatever time, seven, eight in the morning. But we spoke about this, well, the group that I was involved in with uh, a few years ago, we spoke about this when it was brought up a while ago, the, um, the community centre. Um, for me personally, at the moment, um, uh, I'm just grateful that we're going to start the um, splash pad that Marainu has asked for. I mean, it's taken years just to get a splash pad there. And there's nothing more um, appreciative than seeing our, our mum and her five kids under five uh, not having to walk up to the Marine Parade to bathe in the um, the statue pond where they can be uh, at Marae and have the little splash pad there going, which will finally happen, and I'm eternally grateful for that on behalf of a number of people, um, not just myself, uh, for our people. But getting back to Te Pihinga Community Centre, uh, I know you're going to have all sorts of great things going on there when it does happen, and I agree with it happening, you starting it in 2023 instead of now. Uh, simply because um, to get the, you need community involvement. Don't just go out there and get contractors like you're doing with the housing. Get the locals involved, the community that's in that area. Have some sort of involvement with them, and then when the when the uh, community centre is uh, finally open, who knows, that family might have a little plaque on the wall that might say, um, the Ratima family had an, had, had an input in this uh, facility, something like that. 
I mean, you know, and for generations well after we're gone, they'll appreciate that. And their uh, mukapuna, grandchildren, for years to come, they'll see that little plaque and they'll say, oh, my koa helped build this. And it'll be treated like a taonga forevermore, long after we're all gone. And um, that's my take on uh, Te Pihinga anyway. Um, before you get into whatever you need, whatever's going to happen in there, you know, start at the ground and involve the, the locals. Um, housing, we don't need to go there. Um, we've all seen what's going on with housing right around the country. So I'm not even going to touch that subject. The Faraday Centre. Um, I agree with um, keeping it open. Uh, the reason being, we see a lot of our schools having these um, emergency uh, uh, crisis when it comes to tsunamis, earthquakes, that type of thing. Run to the hill, run to Bluff Hill. Well, once you get there, what happens? For me, the Faraday Centre could be an emergency food shelter for keeping food for them, should they be there longer than one day. And if it's an earthquake, they will be there more longer than one day. So to me, the, the Faraday Centre is very important to keep open, especially in times of crisis, because we're teaching our kids where to run to for safety. Well, once they get there, what happens? That's the question I'm asking. What happens? Uh, street management, as you heard from the lady before me, and I don't blame her, I had the same problem. Um, when we're going to Marewa, I take my mum there, um, maybe you should hire my mum. Oh boy, is she a handful when she sees them. Yeah, but um, I won't go there because um, I'm putting mum on the spot now. <laughs> um, traffic safety plans, uh, for me, improve uh, more, more speed humps, please. Especially in the Morainu area. Boy, is it slowed down traffic. And I love it. I don't hear as many burnouts going around Morainui now as I used to. And the more I hear of silence, the better it is for our community. I know that my mokupuna who might be out at the shop getting a, uh, milk or something is going to come home safely. So for me, the speed humps are a necessity in our area. Um, I'm not sure how others feel about it, but for me, it's a, a very, very important safety structure in the city of Napier. Yeah, um, that's it for me, thanks. Thank you, Ian. I'll just uh, invite any councillors that may have questions for you. Councillor Brown. Thank you for your submission. Um, you raised lots of interesting points and I'm keen to see if we can include some of them in the regional park design when we get to that stage, if it goes ahead. Um, the overnight shelter for rough sleepers that you brought up, um, did anything happen there? Nothing. Nothing. Is, is the need still there? Very much so. Okay. Well, the reason we brought it up um, back then was because there was a group called uh, Limitless Hope and they mm. were looking for a permanent premises. And when their uh, uh, premise, uh, premises that they were given by our property brokers fell through, we jumped in and offered to, um, to have an overnight shelter when the community centre was built. And um, we haven't heard anything since. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more question and then we'll need to move on. All right, Councillor Tarpany. Thank you, you, through you, Worship, and I'll limit it to one question. Um, thank you for those promising, encouraging remarks bes around everything that you've spoken to today, um, Ian. But particularly, was there anything on a practical level when you spoke about how you're actively using the estuary at the moment? Most of my questions were around the estuary, but is there anything at a practical level that can help us to enable access? Because you talked about being able to get through a gate in order to access to the upper reach. So in the short term, is there anything practical, simple things that we can do to encourage greater use of that space? while we work at building the conceptual plan of the regional park? Um, not at the moment. At the moment, um, everything's just... Um, we're happy with the way things are. Uh, as I say, the, the man-made um, rock wall that you put there, uh, or whoever's put there, it was a brilliant idea because it does stop the surge of uh, uh, water going out on a low tide and, and traps it in there just west of the airport. And we think that's great. Yeah. Now, Mickey. Thank you, Ian. 
Thank you very much, Ian. Kia ora. And next I'd like to invite Liz Barrett from the Citizens Advice Bureau. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, <coughs> for having me come and speak today. Oh, I'm a board member for Citizens Advice Bureau, and sorry, I need to get this next. How do I? Uh, hmm, how do I get the next slide up? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's what happened last time too, wasn't it? <coughs> uh, just while they're doing that, um, I really, th it was really good to see that Napier City Council at the beginning of your brochure doing the mahi said that there is a risk that people are directly affected by the decisions you make um, don't know about them until it's too late to influence the outcome. And so um, we decided it was important for um, us to come here because we want to be able to continue to offer full services without reductions due to lack of funding or misunderstanding of the significant benefits derived from our services <coughs> and how we can get this to work. Oh, this isn't moving on the screen. In any, in any case, sorry, this isn't moving on the screen. On my screen. Um, so why are we here today? Well, we believe there's a deficiency in our funding. The LTP, which is what we have up here, shows no increase in service level agreements for the next 10 years. And you'll see that I have um, highlighted Citizens Advice Bureau. Can you? And uh, you can see that our funding has, um, is not planned to increase other than the LGCI increases. Um, I am aware of the um, council notes that were put at the back of the submission um, in terms of um, a potential 170,000 being um, perhaps spread over um, the service level agreements, but I, I can find no detail of that within the LTP. So I've shown you, I've gone back to 2019, and in, in fact our funding, um, sorry, is it moving now? Oh, so I don't click, I just go here. Okay, so, so we are very concerned because obviously our funding has not increased for the last six years. There has been an adjustment for um, rent and I'll go into the history of our funding um, towards the end. But uh, this, is, this is what alerted us to the fact that we were very, very concerned. Um, and the comments at the back of our submission not only talked about the 170,000, but also talked about that that 170,000 was going to be allocated based on your funding criteria. And it's not moving. Why isn't it? Okay. Yeah, so, like, I have clicked on the next slide. I clicked on both. So, th the criteria for your funding. is how, how does CAB meet community need? How does CAB um, create community benefit? How do we align with council outcomes and well-beings? And do we have the capacity to deliver? And if we prove all that, consequently, we believe that CAB merits additional funding. Our community needs, well, what are these needs? Impacts of government confidence in digital inclusion realities of digital exclusion, COVID and digitization pressures, and the usual employment contracts, conditions, residential, tenancies, etc. Now, some of those terms <coughs> may be new, 
That, so the digital inclusion blueprint. How many of you have read this report put out by government? Okay, so Megan Woods introduces the blueprint and says everyone has equitable opportunities using digital technologies. Are we ready to go then? Oh, great. Let me just get on to here. Uh, so that's where we were. So these are our needs that I want to specifically talk about today. And so Megan says, um, everyone has equitable opportunities. Basic digital skills and understanding are a strong starting point for lifelong learning. And access to information, et cetera, leads to greater opportunities for increased well-being for all. It sounds wonderful, but what's the reality? <coughs> Well, here's the reality, digital exclusion, not inclusion, and creating new community needs. The government in its report said that research identifies specific groups at risk of being excluded. They were seniors, people with disabilities, people living in rural areas, families with children living in low socioeconomic communities, and Maori. 20, in 2020, CAB did a spotlight on digital exclusion in New Zealand. I'm not sure if any of you, you have read that report. Yeah, um, and our findings based on real one-to-one -one interactions said that people across all age groups are excluded, not just primarily older people. So that problem will not phase out over time. Youth does not guarantee digital inclusion. Maori and Pacifica are disproportionately disadvantaged and clearly overrepresented. And so the transformation of government services to digital is not serving the needs of people equally. So that's digital exclusion. And what, what is digitization? Well, digitization arises from the central government change from paper-based processes to electronic services. Here's a few examples. Immigration New Zealand, closing all its public counter services and ceasing the bulk printing of visa-related forms. Tenancy services, making the option of completing a paper-based application almost invisible on its website. Department of Internal Affairs, no more printing of passport renewal forms. MB, request for, an online, it's request for mediation services with no accessible paper-based option. So how does digitization and COVID-related um, pressures affect us, CAB? Well, we've become the essential intermediary, bridging the gap between government and information and services they need. It's amplified the reliance on us to be there and to be accessible even when others aren't. Ever-increasing ever um, complex queries relating to, for example, wage subsidies, redundancies, tenancies, terminations, and it's now commonplace, would you believe, for government pamphlets and websites to point people towards CAB as the place to go for help. And I've just put up a few examples, so hopefully you'll smile as you see them. So here we go, get financial help with housing, go to CAB. Solving problems with your flatmate, go to CAB. Leaky homes brochure, DIA, go to CAB. Paying infringement fees, go to CAB. Noisy neighbors, go to CAB. Shared driveway problems, go to CAB. So there is um, community need. Our contribution to community benefits. Well, we prevent greater vulnerability. We help at the top of the cliff, not the ambulance at the bottom. We stop further distress with its human and financial costs. We are accessible when people have exhausted all other options or where they just don't know where to turn to. We assist with all digitization issues and now hopefully you understand how broad that is going to be for the future. And we respond rapidly to change in client needs and we're adept in responding to changes in society. We're open six days a week, face to face, and it enables us to reach communities that others struggle to interact with. We help when changes are unforeseen and have unintended consequences. Our volunteers are fully trained to research and find options or solutions for every issue that presents itself. Now think about that. I, as an interviewer, are sitting in the office waiting for a member of our community to walk in and ask me a question on any subject, and we are trained to be able to answer, give guidance, put them on the next step, satisfy, allow them to walk out knowing that they know what their next step should be, or how we can help them solve their problem, or they've solved it 
while they've been with us. CAB and forms. Even if a client never comes into CAB, we have phone, email, website, our talk, chatbot, and other social media services. We provide refugee and immigration courses and, and on-the-spot support, and we run corporate on-site one-on-one -on -one clinics. So why us? How are we different from any of the other agencies? Well, our unique value proposition. We're accessible, accurate, confidential, anonymous, <coughs> independent, and empowering. We're free. You don't, need, you don't need an appointment. There's no time limit. We have very carefully crafted this slide just to give you an indication. Obviously, each, each other agency that we've talked about has wonderful attributes looking and specifically focusing on their community and their concerns. But if those concerns and those agencies can't deal with it, where do people go? They come to CAB. And so we are a, a unique offering differentiated in a way unmatched. Oh, we're neutral free. We empower. We do not engender client dependence but empower them to build their knowledge and skills to solve future problems more independently and to help others. Connecting people to the right information at the right time prevents falling into greater need. Targeted population access. We provide evidence across a range of social issues affecting Napier. Our feedback from the collective experience to local and central governments is unique and invaluable. Our attributes are fundamental to attracting and helping the harder to serve community effectively. And the wealth of data from working with the more vulnerable and hard to serve sheds light for policy and service development. But how does the impact of our presence and your funding uh, meet council outcomes and community well-beings? So we're going to show you how we align with and contribute to. Our community is connected, safe, healthy and resilient, the most primary council concern. So CAB is a critical link working to achieving a community hub, a community that is educated, remains employed, stays healthy and happy, and, create, and creating a greater well-being for all. We contribute to a well-informed, well-educated population, correlating to a society that's proved to have fewer inequities. Every council program, policy, plan, from business development to recreational activities is indexed by CAB and is communicated to clients seeking advice. We have proven our capability with our COVID-19 track record towards the resilience to the effects of emergencies and pandemics. We assisted many hundreds of people during lockdown. We are vital to Napier's emergency processes, but we would like to ask council to think about that not only to have processes in place to ensure our community survives, but council should also be mindful to adequately fund those that directly provide services the council needs, but which cannot provide for yourself. We're a source of strength and adversity, a critical part of the fabric of the community. Hello, Fly. I know everyone likes CAM. <laughs> Sustained by our volunteers' passion for the well-being of others. Um, influences and resources. We are a city that thrives with its community. Well, CAP has been making submissions, influencing Parliament since 1982. Being able to see trends and dialogue with affected people one-on-one -on -one means that CAB <coughs> Napier is an essential voice in the understanding and influencing of social issues. This, we believe, is an important resource for Council. Council says they'll be customer focused. CAB Napier is always customer focused, respecting and providing services to all within the community. Inclusiveness is our priority. We work within our community to support them to identify and implement solutions to the complex social issues seen in our society. Your commitment to the Treaty of Waitangi. We too are committed. Our we opened the Mariah Nui outreach, but unfortunately it was interrupted by COVID lockdown. We note the number of inquiries to CAB from those identifying as Maori is slightly higher than the total Maori population in Napier. CAB puts the customer at the center of service divine delivery, but the equity gap is mounting in our community. 
this gap escalates the urgency to reach Māori and Pacifica more effectively. We will recommence our Mariah Nui Outreach Clinic with appropriate funding and with a full volunteer complement. Hopefully I've shown how Cab Napier not only aligns and contributes to council outcomes, but also builds communities, engages and upskills residents as volunteers um, help each other. We nurture a cooperative, resourceful and resilient community. We provide trusted information and advice in an ever-changing legal environment. But we do so much more by responding to emerging gaps in the community. So consequently, we believe that CAB merits ample funding. So what's our current challenge? Council funding implications and financial sustainability pressure. These are the factors that are putting CAB at risk of not satisfying community needs. Competitiveness for finding not-for-profit funding since COVID. Reduced volunteer resources increased demand for digital exclusion, <coughs> increasing query complexity and increased demand and time-consuming queries. Council funding, 43% of our income versus a national funding average for all CAB across the country of 62%. The time it takes for us to apply for little small grants just to meet our basic cost, which is one FTE and our rent. Incurring rent, unlike other cabs where many of the premises are provided free of charge, um, or where we were before with rent-free premises. We'll talk about that in a minute. So no funding increase appears, and it remains at the same amount of 55,000 except for LGCI. Sorry, Liz, to interrupt, oh, but sorry. we're actually running okay. over time. Um, yep. So if you did want to focus on the rent perhaps quickly and yep. then we'll close off. We won't have time for questions, unfortunately. Sorry, okay. councillors. So our funding history. Um, in 86, the council agreed that for a cab to use women's rest and no rent was charged. In 2013, we were requested by council to move and the funding included the rent. In 2018, we were requested to move again. Um, and this time the funding went to 55,000, which included half the rent. Now, we've had to move because we were, we were then subject to um, market rate rent increases. So we've moved and we've pushed that out for five years. Um, we look forward to the development of the new library um, at some point in the future. Um, if we stay within the same funding envelope, we have increased stresses within the Bureau by staff and volunteers and um, the need to operate within the fixed fiscal arrangements despite rising costs um, um, adds to um, our stresses. I hope that we've demonstrated the value of our services to the community and that CAB Napier merits ample funding. Where would the people go if CAB did not exist? Thank you. And if, if there were any questions, I brought it back to that slide. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Um, a very thorough submission, which of course we have um, read prior to this and then your presentation today as well gave us um, some fantastic information. So we do have uh, some information from council officers around the level of funding that you are requesting in terms of meeting your rental and other operating costs going ahead so we'll take that into consideration as part of our deliberations. Okay. Thank you very much. Next up we have Emily Otto. Oh. Emily and Amelia Otto, fabulous, if you'd like to come up together. <laughs> It is gold. Welcome but to both of you.
Kia ora, good morning, mera mea, councillors, everyone else here, and those watching um, online. Um, the submission is regarding the National Aquarium of New Zealand. So I, I understand that you had a plan to significantly upgrade the existing facility. I am aware that the external funding you were counting on didn't eventuate. The options you are investigating today is mentioned in the LTP 2021-31 to 31, are the same options you were reviewing a year ago, those being refurbishment, repurposement or closure. I support option one, refurbishment. I also look forward to the community consultation once all options have been reviewed. I understand you plan on doing this next year. Am I correct as that's what I read in the June 2nd paper this year as well? So last year I conducted an online survey of 1,000 plus people, so students, teachers and adults, to gauge the support for the National Aquarium of New Zealand. This was in response to us learning that the Napier City Council was considering different options for the aquarium's future. Now, I was not able to include these results in, of this important survey with my written submission in 2020, as the survey ended after the written submission due date. At the oral submission hearing last August, councillors were not able to comment on, or possibly not even consider, uh, the results of the survey as that information was not a part of my original submission. Therefore, I felt I owed it to all those who took the time to answer my survey and express their views so that I submit the results of the survey with this LTP submission. I also take this opportunity to include many of the comments made by the 1,000 plus respondents for you to consider. I think it is very important for you to know how people feel uh, about our National Aquarium and how much support there is for it. I'm here today to share these results in more detail with you. So my survey was sent out to numerous local schools and posted on various Facebook pages as well. Uh, it asked three questions, so number one, the Napier, Council, Napier City Council should keep and maintain the National Aquarium what do you think? Number two, the Napier City Council should refurbish and improve the National Aquarium. What do you think? And number three, the Napier City Council should close and repurpose the National Aquarium. What do you think? Respondents could agree, disagree or remain neutral. They could also make comments if they felt like it. Many of those comments you have in front of you, as well as they were part of my submission. Um, so my aim was to receive over a thousand responses, at least, um, to share the results with you. My hypotheses were that the majority of respondents would be in favour of keeping and maintaining the facility, refurbishing and improving the facility, not closing and repurposing the facility. Personally, I was overwhelmed by the response to my survey and by the results and comments it produced. So, in terms of results, I received 1,005 responses. Approximately 80% were from students, mostly high schools, students, and over 130 teachers responded. Others included parents, caregivers, and general public. Um, for question one, 82% uh, uh, agreed that the Napier City Council should keep and maintain the aquarium. 70% agreed that the Napier City Council should refurbish and improve the aquarium. And 70% disagreed with the closing and repurposing of the aquarium. Now, the results clearly show overwhelming support to keep and maintain the National Aquarium, 82% and also overwhelming support to refurbish and improve the National Aquarium and not to close it down or repurpose it. My hypotheses were correct. One thing that struck me was that from the nearly 500 comments received, only one person mentioned Project Shapeshifter by name, which I think shows the lack of awareness about your initial proposal. The comments and suggestions made covered 
a lot of what you already had in Project Shapeshifter, such as bigger and better enclosures for the animals, new and exciting hands-on exhibits, cafe with sea views, more fish and animals. A few things which stood out, uh, stood out, which Project Shapeshifter didn't or doesn't appear to include. Uh, these subjects, these suggestions were from both students and teachers. Uh, a carbon neutral environmentally friendly building, a marine animal rescue rehab and release centre, and solar panels on the roof of the facility. I also read the council's uh, workshop feedback from consultation with youth and other groups from 2019, which mentioned the same ideas. It must be an eco building, the whole process must be environmentally friendly. It needs to be a rescue and rehabilitation centre, save the animals and teach conservation. As you can see, your own workshop feedback matches up with what respondents commented on in my survey, so it seems to be something community, the community feels strongly about. And as you can see, my submission also includes several pages of comments from respondents to, uh, to my survey. In total, I received nearly 500 comments and I would like to speak um, to that feedback in more detail. I think the comments give you a good idea about what matters most to those surveyed about the National Aquarium. You may have noticed the cert that certain themes come up again and again. I noticed this too and I've graphed the top six uh, comment themes, if you like. Um, in summary, the top six are, so starting at this end with the biggest graph, uh, the animals, so welfare, rescue and rehabilitation, 27.9%, uh, uh, and this percentage is just out of the top six, um, and, but that ex this uh, for the animals theme, um, I uh, this excludes the comments uh, about increasing fish and animal inc um, numbers. Uh, the next one, uh, educational value, 25.7%. Uh, tourism attraction, 14.8%. Valuable asset resource, 11.5%. Uh, family friendly facility, 10.4%. And iconic historic value, 9.5%. And I'd also just like to reiterate, this is not inf new information. This has been all in the comments all along. Um, and keeping in mind the results of my survey and the valuable comments made by so many others, I would like to request that when you consult the community in the future that you include these extra ideas when asking your feedback. It may help you when moving forward with any future proposal. A carbon neutral and environmentally friendly building, solar panels on the roof of the facility, a marine animal rescue rehab and release centre, not just for the penguins, uh, save animals and teach conservation. In the meantime, thank you for continuing to maintain the facility and keeping it operational. It would be such a huge loss for Napier, our region and our country, if you closed it down permanently and got rid of it. Please don't do that. Listen to the people. We love the National Aquarium and we want to keep it. Namahi. Thank you, Amelia. Any questions? Open up for questions. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Kia ora, Amelia, and thank you very much for all your enthusiasm and work um, on the National Aquarium. I think it's very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, when I was reading your submission, I really liked those um, consultation themes or additional um, options that you just went through there at the end mm -hmm. but one of the things when I was reading through your three questions that I thought was possibly missing from your sampling frame was the concept of cost mm -hmm. and I know you mentioned that in the beginning of your submission around that council had been seeking external government funding yes. and so I'm interested um, I suppose in your view on um, locally funded versus centrally funded for any of the options that you consulted on. Uh, yes, well, um, good question. Um, well, everything comes with a cost, we all know that. And also a lot of my comments, I know, oh, not a lot, but uh, several people did mention that they think the government should have a part in like funding, for so external funding for this um, 
kind of operation as they believe because it is the national aquarium that the government should have some kind of contribution to it and also a lot of the questions were what would the cost be to rate payers um, so obviously that could also be an option for funding as well as like kind of like a collaboration uh, with the government funding as well uh, if because the the people obviously would um, as you can see 82 percent are keen to keep the aquarium open that though they will accept that there is a cost for that and and through you, Madam Mayor, just yeah. a supplementary question to that. Is it, um, I suppose, within within your, your sphere at the moment of thinking that there may be some opportunity for central government lobbying on behalf of the city um, in that enthusiasm that you have for this project? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And we'll move now um, into Emily, your submission, please. Okay. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, um, Madam Mayor, councillors, uh, everyone else present, etc. And those watching, we know there are quite a few um, who wanted to tune in today. Um, so I'm basically just reiterating what Amelia said. Um, I ought to support the refurbishment of the National Aquarium. Um, and we both understand that the this is your your big um, for anyone watching the big proposal project shapeshifter um, was big and bold um, people can I think access that online the business case which is fantastic so they can see what we're talking about um, so we understand you haven't had the um, or haven't received the funding yet but I say yet because I am still hopeful and keeping my fingers crossed that you do get it and we know that we'll do whatever we can to help um, that process um, along with the public in general so uh, first of all that's what we want to, that's the uh, end goal um, but thank you for setting aside funds I read that that you are still maintaining it which is fantastic very important um, obviously we don't want it to fall into disrepair and neglect um, so we're really pleased that that's um, continuing um, and another thing we want to thank you for or acknowledge uh, your fantastic, awesome staff at the aquarium. Um, they're just brilliant and we're so, I mean, first of all, we're lucky to have the National Aquarium in our region, um, but we're also really, really lucky to have or fortunate to have the staff that are there um, in charge, looking after it, and, and also I think really passionate about your the, well, th this proposal. So um, we just hope that they, yeah, that that you keep them forever because um, you need people like that to make this sort of thing um, work. So um, we've just noticed how passionate switched on they are. So we appreciate that. Um, I did have some questions. I noticed in the big thick uh, handout thing that you've probably answered some of them, but I'll just uh, repeat those um, for people watching or people here that don't know what I asked. So apart from um, just going to the facility and visiting it, um, I was wondering what the public could do, what more we could do to sort of help uh, or show you how much we care about the place and want to keep it. Um, that was my first question. The second one was if interested people could join a national aquarium think tank that idea just to tap into the community because we're not the only ones we know we're not the only ones who uh, are passionate about keeping it and support it so there's a lot of people out there uh, who would um, join in and help uh, number three when you consult the community um, just if you yeah I'm sure you will, but if you make it very clear how much ratepayers will actually have to cough up, because um, obviously that's a big part of if something's going to cost something, it puts people off. It might not be as much as they think. Um, and to keep something like this facility, I well, that's my opinion, but I think they would um, see the point and, and um, be happy enough about paying, helping to pay for it. There was a gentleman here earlier mentioning about the the um, tepihinga. If the public or the, the obviously if the community is involved, something like a little plaque, in this case a little fish with the family's name on it, like we did for the um, Ocean Spa way back when, 
Um, fantastic idea. We've got a little plaque there as well from our family. Same sort of thing. I think you'll have people um, wanting to do that and wanting to contribute. Um, like Amelia said, uh, I agree, just making the building as eco-friendly as possible in this day and age, very important. Um, and, and the council playing its role in that by leading by example and um, making sure that any new build does sort of go down that pathway. Um, especially since the, it looks like that's what this project is all about. Um, being more environmentally friendly and connecting to, to um, nature. Um, also, the Marine Animal Rescue Rehab Centre idea it seems to be something the community is very interested in having. So, um, I know there are little ones around the country, but if this is going to be the big main hub, then, you know, showcase that. Um, that would be great if that's included if you do um, when you are or when you are consulting because you are going to do that with the community if you could include that please that would be fantastic and lastly um, I saw on page 74 in this um, um, pr um, proposal it talked about the National Aquarium Ocean Centre Trust so um, that sounded like something you could maybe donate to and if it was seen like a charitable trust then Again, people would be happy to um, throw money at that, I'm sure. Um, now, regarding the greener, building greener, uh, if you haven't already, because I don't know if you have, the California Academy of Sciences, that's a fantastic um, facility to just have a look at online. It, it has, like this, uh, an aquarium, a science hub, and a educa education centre. Um, so it's, it's great to see what they've done, how they're doing it, and, and just to see how it works with this whole carbon neutral building um, idea. So I won't go into too much detail about that because you have it in my um, submission, but just everything that they're doing. Um, I think it's quite helpful to read that. Um, again, with the Energy Academy in Europe, that's in Netherlands, and you would have seen lots of other ones, maybe. Um, again, just lots of ideas out there and, and um, something to sort of follow up on. So both of those green builds make the, um, make the most of solar energy, and as we know, Napier, very sunny, we should be doing the same thing. Um, so lastly, yeah, just please keep maintaining the facility um, and um, we'll keep our fingers crossed that you get the funding you need. Um, and um, yeah, so that we have a this fantastic marine centre of excellence. And and to to that end, um, if I or our family can be of any assistance, um, we'd like to put it out there that we'd be happy to do whatever we can. Um, I think we've already got some ideas anyway. So if, if you're happy for us to just go forth and do those, we will, and hopefully something will come of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, and, and certainly we would encourage any community members who would like to assist us to uh, go out there and lobby uh, for different streams of funding. That would be most appreciated, and we will certainly be looking into all the options available to us um, with regards to other external funding streams to assist with uh, whatever the project ends up looking like, because mm. um, we will still require external funding to assist yep. us with that. So. And I'll just open up for any questions from councillors. No. Two very awesome. comprehensive submissions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, so we're now taking a half hour break uh, for lunch and we will be back at one o'clock.